it, it made me realize the legacy, what, what, what these great men had, have, have done, what they did, and how important it is for me as a third generation Italian to, to, to carry that on. But also, I feel a, a huge sense of obligation, not obligation in, in by true definition of what people think, but an obligation to, to tell their story, to, to let everyone know what their story is, what they did, the impact they had in their different ways on, on, on this country. I mean, truly, and I say this, it is, it is the story of the 20th century. It's, it's the roots of the 20th century. And it, it, uh, it has all the colorful elements. And the good news is we don't have to embellish anything. It, it just so happens that everything is true and real. And, and uh, my job or my uh, obligation here again is to make sure that this, I see this through and it's done in, in a way with integrity and quality and accuracy. Pope first saw New York City from the deck of the SS Madonna as it steamed toward Ellis Island in 1906. He was then a boy of 15, and he had arrived alone without family or friends. Like most of his fellow Italian immigrants, he came from a small rural village in the south of Italy. Years later, he often recounted how he had spent his first night in New York sleeping on a park bench. Pope worked as a laborer in the sand pits on Long Island. His determination and his ambition served him well while learning the hard lessons of struggle and survival. Within a decade, Pope became the owner of Colonial Sand and Stone Company and turned the small firm into the largest building supply company in the nation. Colonial provided the materials that built much of the skyline of New York City. that followed, Pope directed his energies and his resources toward the Italian-American community. He developed an interest in politics, and in 1925, he set up an Italian campaign committee that elected Jimmy Walker mayor of New York. Three years later, he bought the largest Italian-language daily newspaper in the country, Il Progresso Italo-Americano, which he used to make himself the principal power broker for the Italian community. He supported the election of Democratic candidates on the local and state levels, and in 1936, President Franklin Roosevelt appointed him the head of the Italian division of the Democratic Party. Pope felt he wanted to share his success with his community and led efforts to make the city's Columbus Day Parade a proud and prestigious event. Like many Americans, he saw Mussolini as the man who had given Italy a new international prestige and as a figure Italian Americans could admire. But when the United States went to war in 1941, he joined with the millions of his fellow Italian Americans in declaring their loyalty to this country. He raised millions of dollars for war bonds and was deeply engaged in the work of Italian Reconstruction following the war. Uh, Generoso was a staunch backer of the United States. He condemned Mussolini and raised more money for war bonds than any other American. And his way of convincing people to uh, become anti-communist was the model that was used by the CIA in future uh, uh, efforts you know, at, uh, at a propaganda, you know, pro-American propaganda.
I'm Congressman Mario Biaggi. What do you consider to be Generoso Pope Seniors, the great-grandfather or the grandfather? What do you think is his enduring legacy on Italian-American society today? In order to answer that question properly, you must understand the tenor of the times. When he was a young man fighting his way through uh, a, a stressful period when civil rights and equal rights were not being considered, there was considerable discrimination. And he was in business and fought, fought against the entrenched people who uh, used violence but he had the strength to survive and strength to rise above it all. He was a strong man. He was a civic-minded man, and he was, loved New York City. General Rosa Pope's most prominent legacy is philanthropy. General Rosa Pope is responsible for educating many, many, many people who today are very successful in their own right. Not only Italian-Americans, but people from all walks of life. He was a great man. Uh, he loved uh, the Italian-American. He loved America. He loved the United States but he really felt that the Italo-Americans should get more recognition in this country than they did. And I think he did more than anyone I know to attain that. Well, when you think of Italian-Americans, you think of Generoso Pope. He is the quintessential Italian-American. He embodied and represented the entire community for a major portion of the 20th century. You know, you have to really put this in the context of the times. Italians, we're not always loved in this country. You know, anytime you're taking something away from someone else, whether it's a job or it's, or it's uh, social climbing or whatever you have, um, people are not gonna be so willing to give it up or they're not gonna be so willing to accept. So Italians were basically hard workers and they were moving forward. So with Generoso out there speaking for them and making sure that they had a source of pride uh, was a good thing. And they, and they were able to feel good about themselves as a result of it, and I think they progressed a great deal because of it. Yes, actually this has uh, been in the makings for three years, and uh, I'm very happy to be a part of this because as a third generation Italian, it's, I hope this exhibit is a catalyst for many people like myself to really learn about their heritage and their roots. The opening provided a chance for the community and the public at large to see the Italian-American achievement, seriously considered in history the first time ever in New York City. It gives me a profound sense of pride and humility to be here. This is the 54th Annual Columbus Day Parade. Now your hosts, Chuck Scarborough and Maria Bartiromo. Thousands of people have gathered to watch what's become a favorite New York tradition, the annual Columbus Day Parade. Good afternoon, I'm Chuck Scarborough, and I'm delighted to be here along with Maria Bartiromo of CNBC covering this parade. We have a terrific seat here. The most difficult, uh, are we're, we're trying to get files, uh, the FBI files, and we had to, uh, we got them through the Freedom of Information Act, uh, FBI files on Gene and Generoso. Now, we got these files, and the ones on Gene had 50 pages were redacted. In other words, 50 pages were missing. So we, we went back and we appealed and said, you know, let's see the rest of it. And they said, no, you can't. So we appealed again and they said, no, you'll have to talk to the CIA about those 50 pages. And uh, I said, what could be of national security importance of something that's happened years and years ago? So we are still waiting. Uh, we have been denied by the CIA to look at those pages. So that is very intriguing. This almost implies that Gene somehow was, you know, continued to stay involved with the CIA long after he left in 1951. Was the Enquirer funded by Frank Costello and, and his money? The answer is yes. But, but you know, keep in mind that, you know, because of, of my grandfather, Frank Costello was like a nephew, not in the sense of a mafia nephew, but, you know, it was just like he was a friend of the family. He was the godson of Frank Costello, who at the time was the number one mafia capo in the Northeast. Gene uh, decided to, he wanted to buy this newspaper, this rag, the New York Enquirer, and he didn't have the money. So that's when he turned to Uncle Frank. And Uncle Frank gave him a $25,000 down payment to buy this, this paper for $75,000.
when the war was on, he donated uh, supplies and food and, you know, he electrified the town when he went back and he's just, he was, he was the town. My expectations were far, I mean, the trip, I, I had to say to myself in the middle of the trip, is this surreal, is this really happening? Let me pinch myself because, you know, it just, it went so well, it was unbelievable. The, I expected it to be a moving experience. I expected to learn a lot, but it was, it was, it was so much beyond that. Um, I would say it was the single most important thing I've ever done in my life, or the single the thing that really moved me the most and really not only put me in touch with my roots and my past and my history and my lineage, but again, it put me in touch with who I am. And as I said before, it gave me a sense of who I am as a person. Prego. Io stavo nelle piccole italiane, andavo a scuola. Siamo andati tutti in villa, ci hanno portato i maestri sopra la fontana. E là dovevamo, dovevamo aspettare che arrivava da Benevento. Ci hanno mandato della farina al comune di Al Paese per distribuirla a tutti i cittadini. E, e così si è fatta una grande festa. L'hanno presa sulle braccia dalla fontana e l'hanno portata fine in chiesa. E che pregio era per lui, che cosa, è stata una, una cosa troppo bella, poi è fatta una... I traveled with Paul David Pump to his ancestral home with him. Uh, and it wasn't just uh, a trip that you went, you stayed in a lot of restaurants and ate a lot of good food. It was a tremendous experience. And when he walked into a paese and the flags were waving and the little children were hugging and kissing him, you immediately understood what the Pope family meant in that region. And you could see in Paul's face how, how, how overwhelmed he was uh, and you could see the tears come to his eyes. Hearing it from, you know, countless hundreds of people, some of the things he had done, and, and, and although he could be this tough uh, businessman and, and built an empire, also knowing the compassionate side. And it really, for me and my life, put everything into perspective. And it's, it's, been, a, it, it's been a journey that, uh, it's been a really neat journey. And, and to trace the roots, it's, it's I, uh, I don't regret it. And uh, I, it's really, it's, it's helped me grow as a person. <laughs>